Well, you can go ahead and have a seat. We want to thank you for being here. Uh, you can open to the book of Luke, chapter 9, as we get started today. Um, we're continuing in our study. If you're in Parker, we are thankful to have you joining us here today as well. Uh, if there's Bibles and a table in the back of the room, you're welcome to stand up at this point and go grab one of those so that you can follow along as well. Now, have you ever been known for something that maybe you didn't really want to be known for? Maybe there was something that happened uh, to you, around you. Maybe there was something that, that you did, a mistake that you made that everyone knew about, but you didn't really want them to know about. Um, I experienced that uh, I've, in a lot of ways, but uh, the one I'm going to share with you uh, happened my freshman year of college. I attended Grand Canyon University, and uh, at the time, uh, all incoming freshmen, uh, as part of Welcome Week, we did a service project. And so the Saturday before school started, we're all assigned different service project areas. So we go out, and uh, I'm assigned to this, this project. There's an outdoor area. We went, and we're clearing a field that was nearby the campus next to a big uh, apartment building uh, with a bunch of refugee uh, residents there. And so we were clearing this field so they could set up uh, a community garden there. Well, as we're, we're kind of arriving and they're telling us what we're going to be doing, there's like all this tall grass and weeds and stuff like that. And they say, hey, uh, some of you guys, we're going to give you guys machetes and you're going to clear that out. And then some of the rest of us, we're going to do and do some of the lighter work behind us. So I'm thinking, okay, you're going to give a bunch of 18-year-old college freshmen machetes. What could go wrong? Like what, what could possibly go wrong? Right? So um, we're working all morning, and no joke, we're 10, maybe 15 minutes at the most away from being completely done with the project. And me and the two other guys that are working the machetes, we're you know, feeling pretty good, and we're working a little quicker, and maybe, possibly, working a little bit more confidently than we should have. Maybe. It's, a, it's an option. Um, but as we're working, I take it and swing the machete, and I didn't know it as I went to swing, I found out after, there's a, a boulder in the midst of the, the grass and the weeds there. Um, and I didn't hit it like squarely, that would have been fine. Instead, I hit it with like the end, the tip of the machete. And so the machete kept moving, but now it was on a different trajectory right into my shin. Now, I don't know how long it's been since you hit your shin on like a ladder or like a, you know, a, a metal coffee table or something like that, but I'll just confidently tell you that slamming into it with a metal blade of a machete hurts worse than any of that. So the project was now done. Um, we were concluded for the morning as, as we scrambled to find you know, a towel or shirt or something to put on my leg because you know, they planned well and they didn't send a first aid kit with the machetes that were going out with these college students for the service project. It was, it was great planning. Um, but so everyone kind of scrambles. We load up in the vans, and, I, and I'm in the front, and they, I glance over at the project leader. I knew him already uh, from previous interactions, and he's like, okay, Robert, we're going to take you to the ER. And I'm thinking, my medical insurance I purchased through the school, that starts the first day of class, which is Monday. This is Saturday. I'm like, no, Joe, you're not gonna take me to the emergency room. He's like, what do you mean? I explain, I'm like, you're not taking me. He's like, okay, we're going to urgent care. And I'm like, same problem, bro, you're not taking me there. Just take me back to campus, it'll be fine. So uh, we go back to campus. I have my, my wife, who was my fiance at the time, go to, to Walgreens and buy all this stuff. And I do, I was like, I've seen ER shows, I can do this. So I like, do my own triage make it happen, clean it all out, bandage it up, everything's great. Move on through the weekend, everything's fine. I'm a little embarrassed, like, okay, like, that's how our project ended, with me, like, shanking myself with a machete. Like, that's not, like, a, a, a positive way to end the service project. But I'm like, you know, there weren't that many people there, let's just move on with it. So, Monday morning, walk into class, and I'm walking down the sidewalk, and there's a guy walking kind of towards me. He pauses, he looks at my leg, which is kind of bandaged up, and he looks up at me, I'm waiting for the inevitable question, what happened, right? No, the question was, hey, you're the machete guy. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? Maybe he's roommates with one of the guys that was there. Maybe that's why he knows. I'm like, it, not everyone knows. There's no way everyone knows about this. Walk into class and four or five people all say the same thing. Hey, you're the machete guy. 
And for the rest of the semester, I was known as the machete guy. Not because I did something like amazing and brave and daring and amazing. No, it's because I tried to chop my own leg off with the machete that I was known as the machete guy. And I'm like, man, I, I feel competent in like these outdoorsy manly things. I've hiked, I've backpacked, I've camped. I'm an Eagle Scout. Like I should know, I should have some like street cred with this stuff. Now I'm the machete guy, who the guy that like almost chopped my leg off with the machete. And I didn't feel that the, the way that I was assigned, the, the, the way that people had assessed me based on that w- one moment was a fair summary of my life and my experiences. And today we're going to look at a, a passage from the book of Luke where Jesus experienced a similar thing. See, for us here today, we know Jesus off of his death, resurrection. We know him off of the miraculous way that he's provided salvation for us. In those days, people knew him off of the things he had done. They knew him off the ways he healed and did amazing miracles. And one miracle in particular stands out above all the rest, and that is the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. And, and this was something that, that spread like wildfire. Like if they had social media, this would have gone viral. Because in, in the Gospel of John, we see that people show up the next day. They had heard about it. And this massive crowd finds Jesus. And they're like, hey, you're the bread guy. Like that's you know, essentially what they were saying. And he has to pivot and say, hey, you guys are missing the point. I didn't come to give you guys free lunch. I came to show you the need to, to crave and seek after God in your life. But see, they knew him off of this one thing, and, and there's actually a really good reason for it. This, this event is an incredible telling of God's power and goodness. And so what I want to do is I want to look at this, and maybe you know this really well. Maybe you've only heard about this but never actually like found the, the source and all the facts. But what I want to do is look at this and say, hey, what does this teach us about God's power and provision in our life? Not just what happened there, but what can happen here. So Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to be. We're going to start down in verse 10. Follow along there with me if you could. It says this. It says, on, the, on their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him and they, they welcomed him and spoke to him of the healing or of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away and the 12 came and said to Jesus, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions for we're here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They say, we have no more than than five loaves and two fish unless we're to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now, before we, we get into all the details and, and the takeaways from this, I want to just highlight a few things here for us, uh, a few kind of details of the story that I think are, are going to be helpful for us as we establish what this means for us. And the first is the, the prevalence of the story. I already mentioned, hey, you know, John's gospel says that in the following day, like crowds show up, but... But this was such a, a, a keystone moment in Jesus' miraculous ministry that, that everyone knew about this. Even the, the gospel writers kind of reflect this reality. See, the, the New Testament starts with four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these are the, the tellings of Jesus' life and ministry. They're basically the biographies of Jesus. And aside from the resurrection of Jesus, the only miracle that's recorded in all four of those is this one. Matthew 14, uh, Mark 6, Luke 9, John 6, all record this miracle. Everyone else, they're, they're highlighting different things. They're, they're focusing on some things, ignoring others. But this one is in all of them. They understood, hey, this is, this is a big deal. This is very telling of who Jesus is. Uh, but also, I, I want to point out the number. See, it, we're told here in, in Luke's gospel, 5,000 men. And he kind of just moves on from this. If you read... If you read Matthew's account, he says 5,000 men not counting women and children. So 5,000 is an impressive feat in and of itself, but when you look at that and say, well, actually, the scholars say that somewhere closer to 15 or 20,000 people that were fed off of those two fish and the five loaves, 
which also the last detail I want to highlight for us is just the source of the food. See, the, the, in this account, it just says that the disciples say, hey, we, we don't have any more than just this. But in John's account, we see where they get that food. And that is that the disciple Andrew brings a boy to Jesus and said, hey, this boy's willing to donate his lunch. He's got five loaves and two fish. Which means that if we hear this story and we imagine like someone like wheeling in a cart with like an 800 pound tuna and the five loaves being like the six foot long like catering hoagie rolls, that's not what it is. Like this is in some little boy's knapsack and I just picture this you know, boy doing what boys do and minding not their own business and he's just like eavesdropping the whole time and offers his lunch. Which also shows that this boy's lunch was pretty insignificant to the grand need that was there. But just a, a small little snippet, like sometimes our offering, the, the actions of faith that we offer to God are pretty insignificant. But when we do it in faith, he finds significance and glorifies our efforts there. So, so that's kind of some details of the story. So let's step back and say, okay, what, what difference does this make? Why is this featured in all four of the Gospels? Why was this one of the most amazing kind of stories of the day and continues to be such today? And the first is that it shows that God is the source of all that we need. See, we, we're, we're very quick to go to like, hey, we can, we can get what we need. We can source food and stuff like that. But in this moment, Jesus showed that, that God is the source of everything that we need. And this is such a foundational reality that we have to understand for life, that we have to understand the needs that we have are met by God. They're, they're provided for, and the source of the, the provisions that we have is God. And, and Jesus talked about this uh, in Matthew chapter 6 pretty uh, clearly. He says, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? He says, for the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So we have to understand that, that in our life, there is a both and reality to this. God is going to provide what we need, but also we need to act in faith to what we're supposed to do and, and be obedient and faithful to that. God is going to provide finances for us, but the way that we get them is by faithfully showing up every single day to the, God, the job that God has placed in our life. God is going to provide food for us, but, but it means we still have to show up at the grocery store, or I guess in this day and age, show up in front of our screen and tap what food we want delivered to our house. Like, we still have to do that. But the, the tension is that we're far more prone to focus on our part of the contribution. We say, hey, it's a both and. God provides, and, and we're faithful to do what he wants, but we just focus on what we do. We, we look at, at our life and, and what we have, and we think that we have it because of our hard work. We, we think we, do, we have what we have because of our business skills or our management abilities we, or our diligence in life. We look at our family and claim all the credit there. We look at our talents and abilities, and we think, oh, well, it's because I fostered these in my life. And every time we do that, it's essentially like what would happen if that boy that provided his lunch went home that day and said, hey mom, I fed 5,000 people today. See, he's not completely wrong, but he's completely ignoring the fact that the only way that happened is because God miraculously showed up and worked in a very real and present way in that situation. And when we say, hey, everything I have is because of my hard work, my efforts, my diligence, my you know, management abilities in life, we're saying, hey, God, you actually didn't do anything. I did all of this. And it's like that boy saying, hey, I fed everybody. My two little fish and five little rolls fed everybody. They did, but it was only because God showed up in a powerful way. And the same is true in our life. When we look at our situations, our possessions, our money, our family, our health, our life situations, and we take all the credit, we wrongly take the credit for what we have. We wrongly take credit and responsibility for the things that God has actually provided for us. And on the other side, when we face those situations like the disciples, where we go, how would I do this? How, I've got a situation I can't solve. If we've wrongly taken all the responsibility for the good things, that makes those challenging moments that much more overwhelming because we've removed the most powerful part of the equation, that is God's work in our life. So today, let me ask you, are you relying on God or yourself for the things that you need? 
Are you trusting in your abilities, your talents, your possessions, your finances to provide? Or are you trusting in the God of the universe who wants to and will provide every need of yours? Which one are you trusting in? Maybe you're stressed about money and the rising cost of things. Maybe, maybe you're stressed about, hey, how am I gonna afford to live if things continue the way they are? Are you stressed about that or are you trusting that God's going to find a way and provide? Maybe you have a, a looming need for a physical item, a place to live, a, a new job, a, a, a health care bill, whatever it may be. Are you trusting that God will provide? So you may be worried about the future, the economy, our country, all those directions, all the things we can't control. Are you anxious about that? Or are you saying, hey, God, I trust that you are good, that you are powerful, and you will work to provide for our needs? See, here we are on Father's Day weekend, and there's, there's no doubt that there's many of you fathers in the room that, that feel the weight of, of provision and, and, and the stress of, of, of making everything happen for your family. And there's a, a healthy God-given uh, call to do that, but if that stress is crippling, if that anxiety is weighing heavy on your soul, it may be that you're taking more of the weight than you need to, and you need to trust, hey God, I, I trust that you're going to provide for me and my family. Instead of me trying to solve everything and do everything, I'm going to say, hey, I trust you. See, the disciples learned that day that, that Jesus is the one who provides for us. But they also learned the difficult reality that we are quick to forget God's power in our life. See, it's so amazing how they responded to this moment because of what led up to it. And, and, and so as we step back from this moment and go, hey, how did they get to this place of being, you know, in the countryside with Jesus feeding 5,000? What happened before that? Well, what happened before that is Jesus sent them out on a mission trip. And he said, hey guys, you're gonna go out and you're gonna preach the gospel and you're gonna heal people and do amazing things. But here's some instructions. Don't take anything with you. The opposite of what I've done for every mission trip I've ever led with teenagers. They're like, don't take extra bags. Don't take extra clothes. Don't take money. He, Jesus instructed them, don't take anything. Just go and God will provide for you. And they're here in this moment with Jesus because they had returned. Verse 10, it started, it says that the apostles came back and said all that God had done. They're talking about that mission trip where Jesus said, don't take anything because God will provide. And yet they're here stressed about the food. Before that, we see what we looked at last week, which is Jesus healing the, the woman who had the, the illness for 12 years and, and raising Jairus' daughter from the grave. They saw that happen, and Jesus performed this miracle. Before that, they were in a, a place where, where Jesus interacted with this demon-possessed man who were told in Scripture was so crazy that they had chained him up in a cemetery. He was naked and scary and freaking everyone out in the city. And after Jesus left, after interacting with this man, Scripture says that he was clothed and in his right mind, and that is what scared people, because they went, wow, how did Jesus do that? On their way to that place, the, the disciples found themselves in a storm. They were at sea, even as sailors, they're like, we're going to die, this, this is bad. And they woke up Jesus, who was taking a nap in this moment, and they said, we're, we're dying, we're, can you do something? And he stood up and he spoke to the wind and the waves, and it says... There was calm. See, in the days and weeks leading up to this moment, the disciples had seen Jesus do amazing and powerful things. They had seen so many evidences of, of his goodness and power. They had seen him uh, show his power over nature, over, over health and even life, and, and provide in miraculous ways. And yet they're here facing a food distribution issue, and they're paralyzed and, and unsure of what to do. And it seems like they've forgotten who Jesus is and how he can act. And it's so easy for us to look at this and go, how could you forget? How could you forget that you're with Jesus who did all of this? And they forgot the same way we do. They got so focused on their present problems or their future problems that they were blinded from the past and how God had shown up in, a, in powerful ways. They were so focused on, on right now and what was going on and what they needed that, that they forgot that God had proven himself over and over and over again. And this isn't a new phenomenon either. So you go back to the Old Testament, there's a pretty big chunk of, of the storyline that, that is God's people 
leaving slavery in Egypt, going out in the desert for 40 years and, and waiting for the, what's called the promised land. God's saying, hey, I'm gonna give you your own nation. And in the book of Joshua, we see that, that they're finally arriving in that place and God is saying, okay, you, here's the instructions. Here's how you're to enter and kind of establish your own nation here. But they were facing a hurdle and that is how they were going to cross the Jordan River. How, what, what were they gonna do in this moment? And God spoke to the leader who was Joshua and said, hey, I'm going to stop the river from flowing so you guys can cross. And you guys just trust that I'm gonna do this and scripture says that he did. The Jordan River stopped flowing. They walked across on dry grounds. And afterwards, God instructed Joshua and said, hey, have the leaders go down and collect 12 stones from the riverbed, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Have them go down and collect stones so they remember this moment. And listen to what it says in Joshua 4. It says, and he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? You shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan River on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan until you passed over just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea when he dried it up for us until we passed over. So all the peoples of the earth will know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you will fear the Lord your God forever. See, God knew that they would be quick to forget his power. And so he said, hey, I need you guys to build a system to remember my power and goodness in your life. And I, and I share this with you, not to say, hey, steal some rocks from our landscaping on the way out. We've got plenty and take them home and put them on your table. But to, to encourage you to find ways to remind yourself of how God has showed up in your life. See, those 12 stones stood as a physical reminder of God's power and goodness for those people. What are the reminders of God's power and goodness in your life? And, and if you're here and you're like, I don't really know, let me encourage you to spend some time reflecting and, and documenting in whatever ways works for you. How has God showed up in your life? What are the curveballs of life that you've experienced that actually turned out to be God working and saving you and helping you through situations? What are the ways that God fixed a problem you were facing or provided for a need that you had? Because Reflecting on his past goodness helps us trust him in those moments of stress, of worry, of anxiety, of what, what is to come. And if you're here and you're like, I, I don't even know if this God stuff is for me, I, I don't have any past to, to reflect back on, then let me encourage you to find a Christian that you know and trust and sit down with them over a meal and say, hey, how has God showed up in your life? And Christians, you better be ready to give an account for the hope that you have in Jesus, as 1 Peter 3 reminds us. Because God is real and there's evidence in all of our lives of his goodness and power in us. And I think if the disciples would have paused and reflected back on the events leading up to this moment, they would have responded to the, that, that stressful encouragement to feed the people a little differently. But see, they also learned that day as they, they walked through this moment that our limitations are not God's limitations. They, they, they were seeing all kinds of limitations, all kinds of, of problems. When, when they saw, hey, the, the day's getting late, we got all these people, they did maybe my favorite solution. They were like, hey, let's just have the people leave so it's not our problem anymore. Like, we, we've got all these people, but if they leave, that's someone else's problem. That's not ours. But when Jesus said, hey, would you feed them? When you put all the different gospel accounts together, we see that they see a problem of, of the place, a, a limitation of the place. They're like, man, where are we gonna buy food? There's not, there's not a bunch of like Safeways and Albertsons around here. There's not you know, a bunch of, of, of Del Tacos where we can get 99 cent tacos. Like how are we gonna feed these people? They see the limitation of money in one of the gospel accounts. They're like, even if there was a place to buy food, where would we come up with the money to, to feed all these people? Some of you parents, especially parents of teenagers, probably voice that as you're walking through the aisles of the grocery store. How are we gonna have money to feed all these people? They see the, the issue of place, of money, of logistics, but Jesus sees opportunity. He sees the opportunity to bless and help people. He sees the opportunity to, to work in a powerful way to prove that he's not just a good teacher, but that he's the son of God and savior of the world. He, he sees an opportunity to, to, to teach, to, to help, to be real and present in their life. And even as the moment is kind of concluding, he sees an opportunity to teach the disciples. Because as it's ending, it says that Jesus sent them out to collect the leftovers. 
which already is kind of an ironic thing. And, and maybe the disciples are like, what are you talking about? What leftovers? Like, there's not going to be anything left. But it says that there were 12 basketfuls of broken food and leftovers that were collected. One basket for each of the disciples. And I kind of imagine that, that they found baskets, they found something to collect the food, and they started walking amongst these groups of 50 people that were scattered around the, the countryside that day. And as they patiently and, and faithfully walked through the crowd, they watched their baskets rise higher and higher of leftovers. And we're not told what the conversation is at the end, but I kind of like to imagine that each disciple just kind of walked up and set the basket down in front of Jesus. It was full of broken food and just stood back silent. And after the 12 of them were there, I like to imagine that they just kind of smiled and nodded like, okay, Jesus, we get it. There's nothing that's impossible for you. We get it. So what about you? Are there things in your life that are full of limitations today, full of things where you're like, man, I don't know how this could possibly end well. Maybe it's that you don't think anything will change in your career and your, in your, uh, your pattern there. Maybe it's that, that you don't think a, a relationship can be restored or redeemed that's broken in your life. Maybe it's that you don't see how the economy or country could ever turn the corner and find new good news. Or maybe you ever wonder how that, that health diagnosis you've got could ever turn out to be something good. And maybe you're here in a place and because of what you're facing, because of the limitations you've seen, maybe you look at those situations and, and see all the limitations and feel hopeless and give up on them. I think sometimes we, we see all the limitations and we remove God from the equation and we say, hey, I'm gonna give up. There's no way this can be good. And maybe you're, you've given up so much you don't even pray about it anymore. You don't even consider how God can work and fix the situation in your life. So today, let me encourage you to think back on two things. First, think back on God's goodness and how he's shown up in your life, as I mentioned, but also think back in the last few weeks. The passages we've looked at together as a church and studied Maybe you're like, hey, this feels kind of similar to the message you preached last week. You just have one message, you, you switch up, or how does that work? No, it's, it's that there is a theme that God was establishing through this, this section of Scripture. And that is that, that Jesus is powerful and that God provides. And so think back on these and look at, at the ways that God has established patterns of providing for his people and caring for us. And remember that whatever you're facing, whatever limitations you see, however hopeless you feel, God is good and will show up. And it may not be, as we talked about last week, the exact way we want it to or the, the, the order and timeline of it, but we know that God is good and he will act. So let me encourage you to, to apply 1 Peter 5, 17 and cast all of your anxieties and worries on God for he cares for you. Because on the other side of that, we get to look back and look at what God has done and say, okay, Jesus, truly you are the Son of God and Savior of the world. Because you have provided, you have acted, you have been real and present in my life. Let's pray together as we conclude. God, we thank you for today. I thank you for the way that, that you have powerfully shown up and, and worked in our life. I thank you that you're not a God who is absent and 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 given us this life to just figure out on our own, but you are with us, you are real and present, providing for our needs, providing for the things of this world. God, we get so hung up on these things, the, the, the things that we need, the, the items, the possessions, the promotions, the whatever. God, help us to long for you as much as we long for the things of this world. Help us to, to, to long for you more than we long for the things of this world. Because God, you were good and you have saved our life and you are far more important than anything else here around us. So help us to live with that reality today. In Jesus' name, amen.